the uh, Edgar Zanotto. Edgar is uh, engineering as a, I mean, your alma mater is uh, yeah. São Carlos, University of São Carlos, and he, nowadays he works with, um, he, he has a big group about uh, glass, ceramics, and uh, he's a very well-known scientist and has several prizes, as Marcia Barbosa, so he's one of the most known uh, scientists in Brazil, certainly in this area of uh, glasses. And uh, today he's going to talk about, uh, you know, about his work and several works that he has been developing uh, in the uh, Federal de San Carlos. So, Edgar, please go ahead. If you have questions, just raise your hand and I, I'll give you the microphone. Okay, thank you very much, Carolina and organizers. It's a big honor and pleasure to be here today. Um, let me go back. Uh, two slides, and uh, we have uh, perhaps one, this is one of the largest glass research centers. It's certainly the largest in Brazil, but one of the largest in the world. Uh, you don't find many faculty working on glass in as a given university. Maybe there are two or three large groups in China, and one very large group in France, and maybe our group is the fifth largest in the world. We have nine PIs, full-time PIs, working on glasses, and four or five collaborators working part-time. Uh, and this center started in 2013, although I have started a few years uh, before that. Um, this is my own research group, the Vitreous Materials Laboratory in the Federal University of São Carlos. I'm, I'm standing. Yeah, no, uh, I, I can, can, see can you see it? Yeah. Okay, because you know here I break my neck if I stay here, so I rather stay a little bit far away. Um, so I I I I work mostly sorry, uh, mostly with uh, the fundamentals of nucleation crystallization of glasses. I did physics and engineering, although I don't know what I am now. I'm a material scientist, but uh, so this is my favorite topic. As you can see here, I started long ago in 1981. It was my first paper. Although I finished my master's thesis in 1978, but it took four years to publish one paper. Nobody cared about publishing those days. You know, Four years after my master's, I have published my first paper. That's when I started working in this area. Because glasses are unstable materials. You crystallize them. If you heat them up, they will crystallize. Any glass will crystallize to reach thermodynamic equilibrium. So this is my field, my area, but I work in a materials engineering department. So most students like to do technology. So we also work on glass ceramics. That's materials that are polycrystalline, but they originated from glasses. You crystallize in a certain way some glasses, and you bring some properties that cannot be uh, achieved any other way. Then I work a little bit, I started like 20 years later, on bioactive glasses, and finally, on machine learning techniques to develop in understanding novel glasses. And this is my talk about this novel hot topic here. We only have six papers here, but uh, they are good ones, I think. Anyway, this is our group. And um, um, so the topic is designing new glasses using machine learning. Um, this is the International Year of Glass, if you don't know, celebrated officially by the United Nations. This is the Year of Glass. Uh, so I will briefly talk about glass types, because I understand that you're not glass experts here. Normally, I skip that part if I give this talk for glass in glass conferences. But I think you, you'll be surprised on the different types of glasses and applications. And then, what's glass? This is not a trivial question. I have spent a few years trying to understand what glass is. I'm still not sure if I do understand them. Uh, and then machine learning. Previous papers, uh, different algorithms, predicting properties. And finally, the hottest topic, that is designing new glasses using machine learning. OK, uh, so this is a brief review. 
properties of glasses. Glasses, oh, there are several types of glasses. There are organic glasses, metallic glasses, polymer glasses. I'll be talking about inorganic oxide glasses today, only oxide glasses, because this is my main field. They have interesting properties. Like if you have a crystal, let's say uh, sodium chloride, you have one atom of sodium by one atom of chlorine. Now, if you have a sodium chloride glass, you can have one atom of sodium and 200 atoms of chlorine, or 1,000 atoms of chlorine, or you name it. There are solid solutions. You can vary the composition you know, all the way from you know, one to one million atoms of different types. That's why glasses have a continuous variation of properties. Any properties can be varied continuously. You just change the chemical composition and you vary all the properties in a continuous way. So there are many, 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 many more glasses than crystalline materials. Because crystalline materials have to follow strict stoichiometries. Glasses do not follow any rule. If you're able to make a glass anyway, that's another story. But you can make a glass of anything if you cool any liquid fast enough to avoid crystallization. Anyway, there's a whole range of properties. And the key thing is, what's the relationship between the chemical composition? Let's say if I can take 50 elements of the periodic table and make a glass, but I cannot predict the resulting properties. And that's the beauty of machine learning. We start to predict properties from knowing the chemical composition. That's the whole uh, story about my talk today. OK, um, so uh, glasses are interesting because they are transparent. Most glasses, anyway. Not all glasses, but most glasses are transparent to visible light. So we don't pay attention. We don't care. This is a, a glass bottle or a window or a lamp or you know, using here in my spectacles. We don't notice glasses. But they are everywhere. They are very important materials. And you know, how much did you use glass today? Every day we use glasses all the time. But we don't pay attention. Of course, you know, you know all of these uh, common daily standard glasses. And recently, with the COVID, uh, we started to pay more attention to pharmaceutical glasses. You cannot store several drugs, including vaccines, in plastics. You have to store them in very special chemically resistant glasses, pharmaceutical glasses. Billions and billions of these flasks have been produced all over the world, including Brazil, you know, to these uh, COVID and other vaccines. Glass windows. This, probably most people don't know this, but even in Brazil, 20% of our electric power generation is already generated in photovoltaic parks. Very few people know this. You think that we, we rely on hydroelectricity. We are more and more photovoltaic parks. This is one that I, I uh, visited. 320,000 solar panels are installed here. And this is not the largest. There are several with more than 1 million uh, um, uh, solar panels. So we don't pay attention to these things, but these are very uh, uh, special glasses, very strong glasses, special glasses that are used in this kind of uses. Optical fibers, everybody heard about optical fibers. Uh, it, it, they're incredible because like, if you have an optical fiber of one kilometer, one kilometer, and I put a laser like this here in one end, 96% of the intensity of the original light ray uh, is transmitted over one kilometer. These are wonderful materials. And um, more or less 3 billion kilometers of optical fibers are installed everywhere. And this is enough to go back and forth four times to the moon. So you have an idea of how much uh, optical fibers we have. A new thing for about glasses, 5G. Everybody's excited about 5G. Well, 5G uh, 
concrete is not transparent to 5G. So if you are here, you cannot get 5G, probably, because concrete absorbs 5G, but glasses are transparent to 5G. So you need more and more and more and more glass windows you know, for your 5G cell phones. If you have, like, if you're colorblind, there's always a certain percentage of the population that's colorblind. There are glasses that correct now colorblinds. For $300, you can buy yourself a pair of these uh, special glasses for color blindness correction. And I, I know this guy who invented these glasses. Interesting story. You can store data, you know, like this is an example here. The Holy Bible is stored here safely by, you know, uh, laser recording. And then you can use a laser to uh, read back this information in glass and do not suffer from electromagnetic um, interference. Bird protection glass. Birds can see in the UV. We can only see in the visible range, but birds can detect UV light. So you can make uh, designs like this. We see this, and birds see that, so they do not crash. Um, I'm giving a few examples just to motivate you, and then I go to the machine learning stuff. Uh, this is a chemical strengthening. It's a very interesting method. You, you know, if you want to improve the strength of glasses, this is the worst property of glasses, low resistance to impact. Uh, you can do a chemical, thermal chemical treatment. For instance, in a potassium nitrate bath at 400 degrees Celsius or so, the potassium ions exchange for sodium ions in the glass, and the surface becomes under compressive stresses. So they become much stronger, much stronger than normal glasses. And the uh, funny thing is that everybody cites the Nature paper, but the Nature paper was published in 1968, but the true inventors, the, these two guys invented this process years before the Nature guy wrote that article anyway, but you know this story. Anyway, let's take a look on the fracture of a chemically strengthened glass. Let's see if this thing works. No? I have perhaps to come here. <clears throat> Standard glass, and now a chemically strengthened glass. This is the glass that you guys have in your cell phones. You know, you're using your cell phones because you have one such glass in the display. And um, by coincidence, I have worked in this field many years ago. This was on one of my first master's students, Oscar Paito. Uh, he is now a professor. And uh, we had a demand for a company producing coffee makers. You know these glass coffee makers? They're very brittle. They're very fragile. It's easy to break them. So they wanted to improve their fracture strength in thermal shock resistance. So we use this process of chemical strengthening. And this is the, this is the fracture strength and the uh, quenching difference. You, you quench the glass to a bath of ice and water and measure the strength again. So the normal coffee makers break with a thermal shock of about 270 degrees Celsius. That's a very useful information for you. This is the limit of your coffee makers, 270 degrees Celsius. So after some work, it was his thesis actually, we treated the glass, we optimized the process, and improved the strength to 370 degrees Celsius. 100 degrees Celsius more, and the actual fracture strength also tripled or so. So this is the actual strength, this is the actual strength, and this is the thermal shock limit. Well, this is how I learned you know, to cooperate with companies. After two years of work, I went back to this company and said, hey, we solved your problem. And they met, 
the director said, very nice, professor, but this is not of our interest because we will no longer sell coffee makers using your process. This is a true story. I'm not kidding. I was a young professor then and said, oh, OK, I'm learning. We always learn. So said my student, let's do some useful products using this technology. And we came up with this special windows for Brazil. Criminals trying to shatter glass window. <laughs> well, see, these guys never attended the material science class. Otherwise, they would not make this error. Anyway, uh, these days, uh, this technology is used in cell phones and in special pharmaceutical uh, glasses, too, which cannot be broken and very special cars, like the theoretical physicist's cars, uh, using um, these chemically strengthened windows. Another hot topic is bioglass, bioactive glass. Bioactive glass is glasses that you can insert in your body, and they will um, chemically react with teeth or cartilage or bone and make a chemical bonding, form a hydroxycarbonate appetite and they, they stick to bone, so eliminate um, a lot of problems in surgical procedures. So bioactive glasses. Um, so um, Professor Larry Hench was a professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He invented these glasses in 1969. He passed away two years ago. In my favorite area, you can, you know, glasses are unstable, so you heat them up in certain controlled way. You crystallize glasses, you change completely the structure, and improve many properties. Many properties are improved, uh, and these are microstructures. Looking at a microscope, these are crystals nucleating, growing in different glasses. Uh, and, and by combining, you know, you can control like what we call microstructural design, the shape of these crystals, their number, their volume fraction, their, their, um, the type, their chemical nature, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the, the size distribution. You can control the properties, the properties, combinations of properties. And I'm going to give just two examples for you. Like Professor Hench invented bioglass in 1970, he came to our lab in 1980 because I was already working a lot on glass crystallization. He wanted to crystallize his bioglass to improve the strength without losing bioactivity. We did that. We did it after a few years, of course. And this is an example. We took his bioglass, we changed the chemical composition a little bit, and then this is a partially crystallized bioglass, and you see this, this strength was 75 megapascal, went up to 220 or so. 200% improvement in the strength of this bioactive material. And this is just by controlling the crystallization process. Another interesting um, thing is my colleague, this is a colleague of mine, Anna, she works on ionic conducting materials. And this is a you know, so the conductivity, this is a log scale, conductivity, inverse of temperature. This is a particular glass. And this is the material after, let's see, glass ceramic, after crystallization. You see many orders of magnitude, four or five orders of magnitude increase in the conductivity if you are able to crystallize a proper organized crystal phase. And these are uh, materials used for lithium and sodium solid state batteries. Anyway, so... You say, just a question. So yeah, you yeah. say you have some uh, patches of crystals inside of your glass? Is that, is that what you have there? Yes, you have a few crystals embedded. I have a sample here I can show in the end. Embedded in the glass. So you control the size, the shape, the nature, everything. And you change completely the properties. This, you know, that's what happens, for instance, here. 
This is a glass. This is a glass with crystals inside percolating. So we have a, a nice path for electrons, or for ions. In this case, it's ions. Lithium ions, in this case. Anyway, uh, yeah. Does it sure. become less ductile as a result? Less ductile. As a no, it becomes more ductile. The K1C, which is the critical stress intensity factor, increases also. So we improve the, the ductility also by partially crystallizing. Now, what's glass? What is glass? <clears throat> so when you say that you can improve the ductility, does it mean that you can have a glass that can plastify before breaking? Well, it's not plastic in the sense of they're not as ductile as a metallic material. Mm -hmm. But there, there is a property called K1C, the critical stress intensity factor, which measures the area under the stress versus deformation curve. That area is a measure of the ductility. That area typically triplicates when you crystallize a glass. It does not come closer to, to a steel, for instance, but increases the, the toughness of the glass. It becomes more ductile, as evaluated by the area under the stress strain curve. But a glass that would plastify before breaking, there's no such thing then? No, okay. no. Well, it shows plastic deformation at very, very short scale. If you look at a nanometer scale, it has some plastic deformation at, you know, in the range of 10 nanometers or so. So you can make an indentation in a glass you know, with, a, with a diamond indenter. You have a flat glass. You can press a diamond indenter. And look at, with an electron microscope. You see some plastic flow in a scale of nanometers. Very short range plastic flow, a little bit, not like a metal. So what's glass? What is glass? Any student here would try to define what is a glass? And this is not easy. What's glass? How you define a glassy material? I know, but this is not easy. So, OK. Well, this is, this is not too far. Let me, this is not completely incorrect. It's not completely incorrect. Let me go and uh, try to give my view on this, although not everybody agree with my definition. But, well, you have a liquid. If you're above the, the melting point, any substance, the liquid state is the thermodynamically stable state above the melting point. Take water above zero degrees Celsius, at normal pressure, the stable state is liquid. So you have a liquid. If you cool down a liquid, any liquid will love to crystallize below the melting point to reach equilibrium. But you can cool a liquid fast enough and avoid, avoid crystallization. That's the whole idea. So you can freeze the liquid structure without crystallizing, and that's a glass. It's a frozen material, temporarily frozen material without crystallizing, which has a structure of the isochemical liquid. And however, let's say that we came to this path here. We fast cooled, and uh, we uh, were able, this is the melting point, I'm sorry. The melting point is here, melting point is here. This is the called fictive temperature here. We form the glass. We form the glass. If we stop here at some temperature of study, this glass will relax, will relax, will relax, relax, and reach this super cool liquid area again. And if we continue to heat it, eventually it will crystallize. So this glass here is relaxing. Even at room temperature, it's relaxing. All glasses are relaxing. The structure is accommodating. Of course, at very low temperatures, it will take zillions of years. It will take a very long time. But if you heat them up, 
they will relax. You can measure the variation of the, any property with time. In this case, it's enthalpy or volume. You can plot any property here. They will vary with time. And at some stage, they will crystallize. So to show you um, uh, our most recent definitions here, there are several definitions. Glass is a non-equilibrium, non-crystalline state of matter. Sorry. Yeah. Can, can I have a water glass? Yes. People have made glassy water. You have to cool it very fast with a cooling rate of 10 to the power 10 Kelvin per second or so. Tiny droplets of water, they become glassy. There are many papers on glassy water. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you repeat? Is this what we do when, when we run cryo-TM, when you have the amorphous yes. water? Yes, yes, yes. OK. Yes. So it's sort of a vitrification but of water. Of course, you know, but water is, is, is known as reluctant glass-forming substance. There are very reluctant glass-forming substances. There are very good glass-forming substances, like sand, SiO2. So there is a whole range of substance, but you can form a glass with any substance, any. Any type of chemical bonding, any substance, you form a glass if you are able to avoid crystallization by fast cooling. So glass is a non-equilibrium, non-crystalline condensed state of matter that shows a glass transition. A glass transition is this thing here, from a super cool liquid to a glass. This is the glass transition. No, ceramics, ceramics are normally polycrystalline materials, which may have some glassy phase mixed. But they're normally, most ceramics are polycrystalline materials. And opaque. All, all of them are opaque. You can make transparent ceramics if you have nano-sized crystals. If the crystals are below the wavelength of visible light, you can also have transparent ceramics. But they're polycrystalline, most of them. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, more question here. Wait. OK. Yeah, uh, you don't require anything on the building block themselves. Nothing. Like you, can you talk about a granular glass, for instance? About what? A granular glass, where the particles are granular, are grains? Yes, yes. Or, um, you you or can have a, a glassy colloid, for instance, mm -hmm. with micron-sized particles. You've, glasses have only short range order. Okay. I think I have a picture. Okay. I have a picture here about short range order versus long range order. Glasses do not have long range order like crystals. Only short range. By short range, I mean two or three angstroms. Okay. Like the molecules are organized, like if you have silica glass. The SiO4 tetrahedra are extremely organized, but then between themselves, they're completely disorganized. So okay. only short range order. Okay, and uh, if the components, the building blocks are active, like people, crowd, crowds, does it fit your definition, like a crowd that is just A jammed? crowd of people. Yeah, or a traffic jam, or like bacteria. I, mean, I think so, yes, yes, because this is the same with colloids, you know. You just enlarge in larger scale. I'm, I'm going to show a video in a minute to you. So the structure of glasses is, is very, very similar to the structure of their liquids of the same chemical composition. They relax, and in the end of their lives, they will crystallize. It will take a long time at room temperature, but you just heat a little bit, they will crystallize to reach equilibrium. So this is. This is our definition. There are 50 other definitions in books in, in the internet, but this is my favorite definition anyway. Um, well, for, for alternative definitions, that this is the newest book. I cannot read here the title, but this is Arun Varshneya, the, the author of this book anyway. Funny enough that uh, this paper here, this is a, a paper published in 2017, is the most downloaded paper of this journal. There are 28,000 papers in this journal. This is the most downloaded paper ever, ever in the history of this journal. But not, not everybody 
agree with this definition. Let me show you a video that my students prepared for a competition this year about this glass transition phenomenon. And then after that, I'll move to machine learning. Glass formation. Liquid. The structure units, people, move fast and independently. This is my lab. Supercooled liquid. The structural units diffuse cooperatively and slower than this in the liquid. This is a key word here. Glass. The structural units are disorganized and do not significantly diffuse. They vibrate and start to relax toward the supercooled liquid state. Supercooled liquid. The structural units diffuse more cooperatively and even slower than in Act 2. Crystal nucleation, a critical nucleus forms in the relaxing supercooled liquid. A nucleus starts to form here. Critical nucleus. And then crystal growth takes over. Crystal. The structural units are organized and only vibrate. Okay. Um. Now, uh, you know, you're familiar with, you know, daily uh, standard glasses. How many glasses of different chemical compositions and different properties do you think have been invented so far by different researchers like me? You know, you go to the lab, you mix things and make a new glass. How many glasses do you think have been made, inorganic glasses? Give me a number. A million. Oh, <laughs> this thing here. I'm sorry. This was terrible. I pressed one more. One million, more or less. Nobody guessed this correctly, you know. People say 100, 200, 1,000. One million glasses have been reported in the literature. Um, so you might think, well, so this feud is over. Let's do some other thing that all the glasses that could be invented have been invented. So years ago, um, I was working at FAPESP those days with uh, my colleague from Chico Coutinho that some of you might know. 
Can I ask something quickly b yeah, yeah. before we move on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you distinguish between the different types of glasses? In no, chemical composition. Oh, just chemical composition. Just chemical okay, composition. Okay. And then they have different properties, etc. but the chemical composition. So we ask that question, how many glasses can still be made? Well, and then, you know, um, there are 80 friend elements in the periodic table. The others are radioactive or very messy to work with, but there are 80 friend elements. You can mix these guys up, you know, two and two, three and three, four and four, five and five, and you, you make just a simple calculation and you come up with this number, 10 to the power 54. Or even more, if, if you allow for 0.1 to 0.1%. What's the difference between amorphous and glass? Ah, that's a very good one. Amorphous materials do not show a glass transition. You know, you can pick a crystalline material, hammer the heck of it, you break the long range order, you form an amorphous material. Or you can evaporate a material onto a thin film, onto a cold substrate, and you can form an amorphous material. It's a material which does not have long range order, but does not relax does not show this glass transition phenomenon. So glasses show this glass transition phenomenon. And you cannot make an amorphous materials from cooling a liquid. It's impossible. So only by you know, uh, radiation or hammering or evaporation. But people confuse amorphous with glassy. They are different materials. <clears throat> so 10 to the power 54. And that's very interesting because you can spend your whole life, get all your students, every student has to make a new glass per day, mixing things, and they'll never be able to come up with 10 to the power 54 combinations of these chemical elements. So, Rich. Sorry, I, I understand that's in practice an infinite number. But why it's not a strictly an infinite number? Because if you can, if you, but I mean. It's an infinite number. Right, yeah. In practice, it, yeah, yes. But it's an infinite number. It's an infinite number. So research needs thinking, thinking. How can we solve this problem? We cannot go to the lab and mix things and you know, follow the traditional way. That's me, my lab. This is Vitreous Materials Laboratory thinking, consulting. My magic glass ball. You see, glasses have several uses, you know. And uh, they're very good substances for machine learning. Because of this particular feature that glasses do not have an organized structure. They're like liquids. They're frozen liquids. So the, it, this there is a direct relationship between the chemical composition and the properties, the structure and properties. But you don't need even have to know the structure, because there is a relationship between the chemical composition and the prop all the properties. But these relationships are hidden. We don't know them. They are hidden. Like if I have a glass with 15 components, I cannot predict the properties. That's where we can use machine learning. We can train different algorithms by inputting data. People have measured one million glasses, right? If I can have some students to collect all this information from the literature and get you know, the chemical composition, the refractive index, the chemical composition, the hardness, chemical composition, the thermal expansion coefficient, or the density, or any property, or the specific heat, or any property, you use this information and feed this information to some machine learning algorithm. There are many algorithms. And then the algorithms themselves generate empirical models. These are statistics. It's brute force, statistics. They generate models to correlate compositions and properties. That's the idea. Sorry. So glasses do not have structures, like for a ceramic. If you have a polycrystalline ceramic, Things are much more complicated because in addition to the chemical composition, the properties depend on the crystals that are inside, 
on their structure, their nature, their size, their volume fraction. It becomes much, much more complicated. It's still possible, but it becomes much more complicated to uh, uh, make these predictions. You say that uh, we can think uh, a glass as uh, frozen liquid. liquid. But what difference have a glass uh, compared with a highly viscous liquid like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I understand. You understand? Yeah, yeah I understand. It's, you can consider a glass a highly, highly viscous liquid. It's a highly, highly viscous liquid. The structure is the structure of a liquid. They relax like a liquid, and they crystallize like a super cool liquid. So yeah. if you say that, if I put a, a, a glass in a vertical position with the time, it's going to disperse? Yes, but you have to wait. Yeah, how, how, the, how the much? The question is how long you have to wait. If you are at room temperature, we have calculated and published this. Uh, do cathedral glasses flow? Look in the literature, you'll find our papers in 1998 in the American Journal of Physics. And the time, the estimated time is 10 to the power 24 years. You know, you just wait, get your student there measuring every day. And you, that, that is at room temperature. Of course, if you heat them up, then it will flow in minutes or hours, depending, depending on the temperature. So glasses are special materials. They are suited for machine learning because of this lack of structure. Structure materials, of course, you can do machine learning, but it, it's much, much more complicated. The number of variables is much larger. Here, I only have one variable, chemical composition. So get your students. You have one million glasses published elsewhere, one million papers. Look them all, get the composition property, composition property, composition property, and then let's do some, some, some play some games with machine learning algorithms. <clears throat> so, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. This, this is, the aim is to design. This the is what? Learn, the aim of doing this uh, training of yeah. a machine is to design. Yes. But, if you want to design, if you want to use machine learning, you can only interpolate between existing designs. But if you want to design, you want to design something that doesn't exist so that you would want to extrapolate, no? Uh, I, good question. Wait a little bit. I'm going to touch on this, on this topic. Just wait for three or four slides. Uh, so thing is, previous papers using machine learning. The first paper. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, was published in 1996. And then a few papers, you know. But they're very, very basic, you know. I hope none, none of these authors are here. But, you know, they're very basic papers. Like their training was done with 50 compositions or so. You know, 200 compositions. This is nothing. You know, this is nothing. I mean, the, the, real, the real game started in 2018, four years ago, when um, we published this paper here in 2018 with 55,000 compositions. This is a real training for such a complex problem involving too many chemical components and complicated properties. We did, so in 2018, several interesting papers appeared including our paper uh, 2018. Um, this, this journal is not very well known uh, to you, the physicists, but it's the, it's the brother of uh, PRL, you know, the, the, for material science. This is the uh, impact factor is 9.2, and they reject 90% of the articles. So it's not easy to publish in this, in this journal. Um, anyway. The key thing here is that we trained um, a particular neural network, artificial neural network algorithm with 55,000 data composition, TG. In this particular case, glass transition temperature. That 
particular temperature, which is very important. And um, so um, then we publish a few other papers. And this is the result, like uh, testing different algorithms. This SVR is a type of algorithm. Random forest is another algorithm. And this is, for instance, um, this is, for instance, the predicted value by the algorithm versus the measured value of the glass transition temperature. Predicted value versus measured value. And then um, uh, using some, uh, ah, this is the SVR, this is the random forest. Predicted value versus measured value. By the way, when we took 55,000 uh, data sets, uh, we left 5,000 out of the training. So 5,000 stayed out of the training. So this refers to 5,000 data that were not used you know, in the training procedure. So just to see the interpolation ability. So you're asking about interpolation versus extrapolation, right? The interpolation ability is very good. However, the uh, extrapolation ability, this is another way to show the error. The error, this is the error. Zero is very good, almost no error. But it increases here or here for very low values of this particular TG, the temp very low values or very high values, the errors increase. So the extrapolation ability is not very good because of the training, of the poor training procedure. I mean, we had very good training for intermediate values of the properties, a very poor training for the, uh, for the um, limiting values of the properties, either too low or too high values of the properties. So, so the quality of these results, depending on the quality of the training, I have a question. You said that you put, let's say, you have the composition and the, a given property. Yes. And now what you are showing is the, the predicted and the, the known TG. Yes. So, but then somehow you put information about the TG in your data to train, right? Yeah, but this test is, with, is made with a, a, a set was, which was not used in the training. Right, but you also have the information about TG in your setting training. Yes, the training was composition TG, composition TG, composition okay. TG. We trained with 50,000. Okay. Then we used 5,000, which were not used to test the quality of the training. And you also can, could have several other properties. Oh, or, yes. Be, yeah. Beyond the TG, right? Yes, so, yes, I will show results for other properties. This is for TG. This is different algorithms. You know, right. different algorithms, different algorithms. And uh, let me go back a little bit. Uh, see, the random forest, we found that the random forest is best. Look at the R2 here of the testing set. The R2 is largest for the random forest, very good for the KNN, and not so good for other algorithms. So these particular algorithms, these two algorithms are especially good for this type of problem. For other types of problems, maybe all their algorithms work best, you know. So, um, so I have a question about different properties. So yes. it means that if you are trying to train or predict multiple properties, maybe with interpolation, you'd be able to get compositions which have simultaneously properties that in your data set nothing has, right? If you yeah. can train the most of several things together. Yes, okay. yes. Well, another way to test the error in the prediction ability, you see some elements, for instance, palladium, ruthenium, thorium, uranium, they only appear in a, few, in a few compositions, like only one composition out of 5,000 had a hydrogen. Only five had the palladium. So the training is also poor for those elements that are not very frequent in your training set. So here we found that only elements which appeared in over 600 compositions, you know, the error was very, very small. 
this is zero. So the error is very, very small. But you need at least 600 compositions containing that particular element for this particular property, still TG, uh, to have a decent uh, prediction ability. Uh, oh, these are other properties. Carolina, refractive index. Can do the same thing for the refractive index of the glasses. The same pattern. When you go to very high, these are very high values of refractive index, 2.6 or very, very high values. So the, then the prediction ability becomes poorer and poorer because of the poor training. There are very few glasses which such a high value of refractive index. I'm curious about what you input in your neural networks. What is, you know, you, the compo you say the composition, so what, how do you represent? Oh, the, how I represent the composition? Yeah. Okay. So I represent this way, like 2% Na2O, 5% Al2O3, and uh, I don't know, X percent of SiO2, Y percent of, this is how you represent. You several, oh, I have a glass made of ba, 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 the refractive index is such. So it's a vector. It's a vector. It's a vector with all the elements of the periodic table that are friendly, 80 elements or so, that have been used along the years. Okay. Could you do the same with the, the typical structure of, of your glass? Like you take a snapshot of your glass and you look at the... In principle, you could do that if you had data. In principle, you could do that. Yes, take pictures and input the pictures. People have done that with binary systems or so. Mm. But not with this, comp you know, 15 components, it's impossible. But with binary, ternary systems, you can do that. Because I understand that what the glass, at least in the physics uh, community, what the glass people would like to do is to understand, you know, whether you have some evidence of the dynamics of the glass transition temperature in the structure. Yes. And so somehow your, your neural networks have done that, I guess. So yes. could you use somehow or learn something about the relationship between or the you know, structural signature of the dynamics based using your neural network? Yes, yes. You can, uh -huh. instead of using the chemical composition, you can input, for instance, the ionic radius, the dissociation energy, the atomic weight, you know, all the physical chemical properties and try to understand the physics behind it. And there are people doing that. There are people definitely doing that. And I have a list of physics-based machine learning. 45? Uh, 50. 50, <laughs> 50, okay. So let but me people rush. People have been asking so many questions. No, no problem. Okay, I can rush. Uh, and then, uh, anyway, I'm telling here that you can take any property any property, we have done this for different properties. And again, you see the Rano Forest, the KNN, the DT, all of them lose their prediction ability when you go to very high values, which is bad anyway. This is an open problem. I mean, this is an open problem still, uh, but still better than guessing, you know. The machine learning will give you some avenue, you know, try this way, this way, rather than, you know, 360 degrees. It will show some directions. But let me show you quickly elastic modulus, you know, the Young's modulus, the same thing. Poorer ability here for low values or very high values. Very good prediction ability for intermediate values. And uh, so, final part of this talk, designing novel glasses. How can we design a new glass now? Okay, we can do all this training, all this training with different properties. And then you might ask, well, I want an optical glass with a such value of the refractive index, very high value of the refractive index, and very low value of TG, for instance, or very high value of, of hardness, of elastic modules of CP or any property. I want combination of properties now. And please, algorithm. Now you need another algorithm, like a genetic algorithm, to dig deeper in the models generated by the machine learning algorithms and do the inverse. 
the, these algorithms, they had composition property, composition property, composition. Now, I, I need another algorithm to say, I want this property, this property, and this property. Look at the composition of space and tell me which compositions might give that combination of properties. So it's an inverse design. After training, first you have to do all this hard work of gathering data and training. Designing novel glasses. And as I said, you know, there are a huge space there to design novel glasses. And uh, engineering new compositions. Engineering or designing new compositions with combinations of properties. Let me give you now uh, a sketch that I did the other day. So let's see that I'm trying to predict the liquidus. This is the liquidus temperature of a binary system. It's a phase equilibrium diagram. So I have, I have here some property. In this case, uh, the temperature, and this is the composition. And I have this complicated, this is a complicated function here. So if I only give, if I only have this data point here and this data point here, no matter which algorithm you use, it will say, well, this is the liquidus. <laughs> you only have two data, but this is the best the algorithm can do. So now if I have one, two, three, four, the best algorithm will say, well, this is the liquidus. Now if I have more data points, it could say, well, this is the liquidus. And it can even extrapolate here if, if you come up with a good model. But you can certainly interpolate. I want to know the liquidus of this temperature. So we can interpolate very well. So, so this example is just to show that uh, the quality of the models generated depend on the quality and quantity of data points that you feed the algorithm. So OK, chalcogenide glasses. You, you, this is a particular type of glass which does not have oxygen. And they no, do not have oxygen, so they transmit in the infrared rather than in the visible. They, they are used in, uh, we just published this paper this month. They are used for night vision. You see it? transmission here, and this is the infrared. One micro, this is the infrared. You see these glasses here, tellurides or selenides or sulfides, they transmit far in the infrared. So they are used for night vision. This is what you see. And this is what you see with a night vision Google like this, with these chalcogenide glasses. So I want to design a chalcogenide glass which has a high transmittance in the infrared, high hardness, high chemical durability, particular value of refractive index, you name it. I want to design a new glass. How can I do this? Do a training, get whatever we have in the literature for the properties that have been measured by somebody. And then in this, you do what is called SHAP analysis. It's, it's another algorithm that analyzes the models generated by the machine learning training. And this is a nice result. You see? Uh, the TG again, because this is an important property. See, if I want to design a glass with high TG, this is red is high, blue is low. So a, a high amount of germanium, high amount of germanium, or gallium, or barium, or silicon will give a glass with a high TG, a chalcogenide glass with high TG. So even if you don't know anything about machine learning, you don't care about machine learning. You're a glass guy trying to develop a new glass. You work for an industry. You now focus on germanium, gallium, barium, or silicon, rather than the whole periodic table. Or if you want a glass with low TG, go for selenium, tellurium, or tulium. These are glasses with very low TG, so minus 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, in relation to the average. So you see what I mean. Instead of looking at the whole periodic table, machine learning is teaching us, you know, look here, not here. This will make the lives 
of glass designers of research much uh, easier. I never worked with chalcogenide glasses, but now I can do chalcogenide glasses with much less effort, with a lower high TG, or I am not showing here the result, but it, these guys in yellow here, this, this, and this, also decrease the CTE. So if I want a glass with low coefficient of thermal expansion and uh, high TG, I can use germanium, gallium, or silicon. So combinations of properties. Or I want a glass with a high refractive index. Oh, OK, then you go for tellurium, tulium, antimony, lead, uh, silicon, indium, or bismuth. See the game. This is the result, a real result of machine learning. And um, I can also uh, do the same thing for hardness, but I'm running out of time. So let's see optical glasses. Optical glasses are very important everywhere. So this is the famous Abbey diagram. You have the refractive index versus the Abbey number. The Abbey number is just a measure of how sensitive the refractive index is to the wavelength of light. So it's a measure of the dispersion, of the dispersion. So low ab number means that refractive index depends a lot on the wavelength of light. High ab number, it does, almost does not depend on the wavelength of light. So these are all existing optical glasses by three companies. So if, if you're an optical designer, you're designing new equipment, you want a glass here with this combination of properties, this value of refractive index and this AB number, together with this glass here for your optical element. Like in an optical microscope, you know, a simple optical microscope, how many glasses there are in an objective lens of an op optical microscope. 15 different glasses or so to avoid chromatic aberration, spherical aberration. There's all sorts of optical problems that designers use. So maybe I want a glass here for my design. But no company makes this glass. These are the commercial glasses. I want a new glass for my equipment. Then I can then do a training. We did that for TG and for refractive index using 45,000 here, 41,000 here. 38 chemical elements here, 39 chemical elements here. This is what we gather from the literature. And we wanted a glass for a particular application with a refractive index larger than 1.7 TG, smaller than 500. We wanted this glass. Nobody made this glass. It, it does not exist. You cannot buy this glass. And I you know, waste my whole career trying to make this glass empirically, even if I have some knowledge about glasses. So we trained. Here's the training and the result of the training. Predicted value, reported value, predicted value for TG, reported value for refractive index for TG. And uh, that's it. The algorithm, this is a Nobody made this glass. The, this particular algorithm said, hey, you want a glass with 1.7 target and a TG of 450. So try this composition here. 66.67 silica, blah, 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 blah. Try this one. We did. We went to the lab, made the glass, and these are the results. This is the desired value. This is the experimentally measured value, 1.71 plus or less 3 in this decimal place here, 450, 438. And uh, then we said, well, let's do a tougher exercise. Tougher exercise, higher value of TG, lower value of, of NED, lower value of TG. This is a much more difficult exercise. And the algorithm said, look at how crazy this composition is. Crazy, crazy. I would never, never be able to come up with this composition empirically. But the algorithm says, try this one. We did. These are, look, 
Target value, measured value. Target value, measured value. A little bit above the target, but still, you know, it's unbelievable. Did you try also including uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion? We did not try yet, but it can be done. It can be done. This is recent results with only two properties, but you can try with three, four, five. It becomes more and more difficult, but it can be done. Um, so I imagine that the refractive index and glass transition temperature is, uh, let me call this a two-dimensional uh, yes. vector, yeah. is a function of 39 variables, namely the third, uh, 39 composition. Yeah. Uh, what does this manifold look like? As in, if you change uh, let's say only one composition yeah. slightly. Is it like very steep or uh, as in does a slight change make a very large change in this vector? And it's a good question. We never try to plot this, but I can, I can give you my feeling on this. Uh, these two properties are very sensitive to composition. Other properties are not very sensitive, like the elastic modulus is not so sensitive, but the refractive index and TG are two Properties, they're as sensitive to minor changes in composition. So I think it would be steep, but I never plotted. So how is it that uh, machine learning is so successful in, in you know, making uh, these predictions when you know, we have such... Because of the good training. Remember, I had 45,000 compositions. If you do this training with only 200, 300, it would certainly be a nightmare. But we used a lot, a lot of compositions. To be honest with you, I am surprised with this result too. You know. But if you don't believe, I brought the glass here. I'm an experimentalist by heart. So you can see the actual glass. This, this glass here, this glass here is here. So you can take a look. And this is the, you can measure the refractive index and the TG if you don't believe me. So um, it's. It, you know, you need a good training. You need a very good. Also, I'm not extrapolating. Remember, I'm not going to a refractive index of 2.5. I'm, I'm in a comfortable range of 1.7. If I extrapolate, the error will be larger, for sure. You know? But this is unbelievable because I have been working for 45 years with glasses. I started in December 1976. Actually, one year before, because I had an internship in 1975, but anyway, uh, and I would never be able to design these compositions, you know, using my experience in these areas if I were not using machine learning. Anyway, uh, there are other things, but uh, I think I run out of time now. So yeah, you do have several questions, I believe. Oh, by the way, uh, I need this glass back, please, because this is a historical piece of glass. It, it has no commercial value, but it's very dear to me, you know. <laughs> I spent five years to get this glass done. Just a side question. How did you feed the 45,000 of data times in, in the, to the, I had in a the very, computer? I had a very good postdoc <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Uh, it was a hard work. It was a hard work. But uh, he, he wrote a, a code to read, you know, we wrote a vector and then the code wow. read, yeah. But it was a hard work to transform this into a vector. Uh, I have a, a broad uh, question that may, may sound naive, but uh, how, how, how are the companies responding to this? Like they are hiring people to design glasses and of a, with specific properties? How, how is the job market in this sense? They are working very heavy in this area, very heavy. I gave a talk in Cancun, maybe a month ago, and the, all the attendees were industry people. They, they are definitely working in this area. They do not publish, of course, but they are. They are working because this is the way to go you know, for, for glass design. I have no question about this, please. I'm curious about why people uh, call spin glass for uh, the Isa model of random bones. Is there something with real glasses? Yeah, yeah. Spin glasses are not glasses in the sense that I'm talking about. 
you know, just these things are, are random, but their structure is crystalline, you know. But most spin glasses have the, the molecular structure is crystalline. Only these spins are random. So I cannot use uh, this definition, this <laughs> definition of glass for spin glasses. Where is the liquid spins in this context? Eu, eu Have you não... thought about the liquid spin? If you, glass are liquid uh, in, in, definite, in special process of uh, thermalization, uh -huh. the spin glass should be expected to, to be a spin liquid. Should yeah, thermalize. I, I, I don't know, actually. I don't know if a spin glass shows a glass transition. Can you change? I'm not familiar it's with It's just the name. name. Just no, the I name. mean, but can you change um, a spin liquid, a glass, is, <laughs> a spin glass to a crystalline spin by thermal treatment? I don't know. No, I, I, don't. I don't know. If a glass, a real glass, has to show a glass transition, relax, and crystallize. If you can crystallize a spin glass, so the name spin glass is just the name, just your name. Yeah. Spin glass is just. It's just, just a name. It's just, just the spins just are disorganized, you know, but not the structure. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Any, any material with spin glasses, they are crystalline materials. It's not a, because the spins in this concept is just the spin of the wave function of the atoms of the molecules. It is very reduced model for ferromagnetic things, yeah. but still there is a wave function over there. Right. And this wave function of the elements exists also in the liquid state. It right. exists also in the solid state. Right. So if this spin is a reduced wave function, it should be something uh, similar, like uh, an object in the liquid spins. Perhaps, I don't know. Perhaps. Well, that's a speculation, so thank you. <laughs> yes. Is there anything that you've learned that you could uh, then teach to, you know, uh, like uh, someone making steel or someone making, you know, supramolecular polymers? Like, what have you learned that's beyond the scope of glasses uh, for material design in general? Well, I, uh, I'm not following the whole literature. There is a huge literature in, in, in this area. But one thing I learned is that people making metallic glasses. Metallic glasses are very interesting. Uh, on the other hand, they're very difficult to vitrify. Metals, you know, because of their structure, this cloud of electrons, and there's no uh, covalent bonding. It's just metallic bonding. They easily crystallize. Metallic glass is easily crystallized, so it's very difficult to make them into the glass state. So many papers in the metallic glass community using machine learning, they are looking for the so-called glass forming ability, glass forming ability. So they are trying to look for um, chemical or physical features that favor vitrification, that favor vitrification for metallic glasses. But there are papers on steels, there are papers on ceramics, and many papers on polymers, but I'm not, I'm not following all these papers. I would not know the state of art for these other types of materials. So, Edgar, let me ask you, uh, that's not a, even a question, perhaps a comment, that you say you, have a, you are training with a, a, big, uh, a very big set. But actually, it's just a tiny fraction of uh, the infinite number of glasses that you have. So actually, it's, it's almost a miracle that this, this thing is, is working. In the sense that uh, we would guess that you have several minima in this landscape. And then uh, the, the thing that your algorithm is finding could be just uh, not uh, the true minima. I don't know. Then uh, perhaps it's just more like a comment that he was doing. Why does it work? And I think there is no answer. There is no clear answer for that, right? Why is this thing working? Because in principle, even though you have a lot of uh, glasses in the training set, it's just a very a tiny fraction of the whole uh, set. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's working because I'm not exploring extreme values of the properties. I'm just exploring average values of these properties where the training was good enough. 
if I try to, exp which would be very nice, to explore the extreme values, very, very low or very, very high, then the errors will be larger because of lack of training, lack of training. But it's working because I'm, I'm in a comfortable zone. But there's still many, many, no. many, many things to do within the comfortable zone. Sure. Like I said, you know, like I said, like if I want, these are very nice, these, uh, um, uh, how you call these bags, glass bags. I have seen one. They're beautiful. Very expensive, though. <laughs> if you want to design a very nice, shiny bag like this uh, with very high refractive index, and, and uh, low ab number. So these are crystal, incorrectly called crystal glasses. They're, these, they are called crystal glasses incorrectly because they shine like a crystal, but they are glasses. It's an incorrect number, okay? Uh, uh, name. Like my mother has a set of these that she never uses. You, know? <laughs> you cannot use that set. So in this case, what do you want? The normal lab crystal glasses have a refractive index of 1.52 or so in the ab number of 55. You want to come here. You know, you want to come here. Higher refractive index, lower ab number. Uh, you know, they want shinier uh, materials. But if you're not interested in glasses and if you play golf, the very best driver, this is a driver, a driver, to play golf, the very best driver was designed by machine learning two or three years ago. Ah, two yeah, three years ago. They have simulated 15,000 different designs of the head to maximize what's called the sweet spot. The sweet spot normally is in the center, but this machine learning, machine learning guided driver, the whole is this sweet spot. So even a poor player like me can hit very long with a driver like this, and I actually have one. But don't tell anybody. People who do not attend material science class do not know these things. <clears throat> I mean, it's a wonderful talk, Edgar. And uh, I mean, how, how you protect your data bank? Pro I'm sorry. Pro I, I mean, how, how you keep, like, secret? You have potentially, uh, I know how many patents you can, <laughs> you can sell for the companies, but you have uh, like a postdoc doing that. H how you protect, how you manage, people need to like s sign uh, confidentiality. Yes, and... they have to sign confidentiality agreements. The thesis defense is, is closed. Only the, only the committee attends and they sign confidentiality agreements, etc., etc. That's That's how you try. That's how you try to protect. Not always you can do that. But uh, um, that's how we do it. Is there a prospect of uh, exploring some of the properties that depend on the preparation? You showed us properties that depend on composition. Yeah. But at the beginning of the talk, you said that preparation can drastically alter some of these properties, like partial crystallization and cooling rate. Do you think that this approach would be valid? Because I, I imagine that the data would be very scarce about what would happen in different techniques. Yes, uh, this is a very good question. Some properties are more, uh, uh, more sensitive to, to the method of preparation than others. And uh, luckily, for glasses, if you, crystallize, if you crystallize the glass, then you're dead. That, that the properties change dramatically. But if you do not crystallize, only vary the cooling rate, but still do not crystallize, then the variation properties is small, like within 5% or so, which is even larger than the experimental errors that you normally have in your data set. So the synthesis procedure only becomes very significant if you partially crystallize your glass. Then you're, then you're dead, I think. No, as a, if you crystallize. Yeah. yeah, yeah, if you crystallize, you cannot explore. Then you have to do another type of training, taking the crystal size, the crystal fraction, everything into account. Yeah. 
I have kind of a similar question. So a success of these machine learning models typically depends a lot on the featureization that you end up using, right? Yeah. So you use chemical composition and you make some vector. But is there a more natural way to, to represent glasses, right, or these, these compositions, rather than just a single vector of, of numbers, right? Is there, is there any way you can include other information that might help, let's say help between quotations, right, help your machine learning model to perform better or to extrapolate better or yes. have less error? Have you thought about this? Yes, yes. In principle, yes. Like I said, you can include the ionic field strength, the molecular weight, the melting point, the you name it, the, you know, all the chemical, physical properties of each element and, and, and try to see if there are correlations. For instance, refractive index. We know that the polarizability is very important for refractive index, so you have to include that or even density, you know, denser, heavier atoms increase the refractive index, lighter atoms decrease. So yes, you can play these kind of games, and uh, there are people doing this, of course, to improve the prediction ability. Yes, Thank you. definitely. <clears throat> well, if there is no more question, let's thank uh, Edgar again. Thank you.